الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ووصينا الإنسان بوالديه حملته أمه وهنا على وهن وفصاله في عامين أن اشكر لي ولوالديك إلي المصير وإن جاهدك على أن تشرك بما ليس لك به علم فلا تطعهما وصاحبهما في الدنيا معروفا واتبع سبيل من أناب إلي ثم إلي مرجعكم فأنبئكم بما كنتم تعملون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Once again, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. You notice that ayah number 13 was when Luqman started speaking with his son. And then if you go to ayah number 16, he's going to start speaking with his son again. But in between, you have ayahs number 14 and 15. And in these two ayat, it is actually a commentary from Allah. That is an interjection from Allah. So this kind of immediate transition suggests that it's as though, you know, I don't know, I, I want to give you some sort of a visual explanation of what's happening. Sometimes teachers, they show a video in class. You ever have that? Like a teacher shows a video in class? And so the teacher shows a video and he gets to a clip and he hits the pause button and has some, some of his own comments. And then he goes on and plays it again. And that's literally what's happening here. Allah played us a scene from Luqman talking to his son. And then it was important to pause there and Allah would make some of his own comments and then go back to the rest of the film the rest of the story, right? So that's a really beautiful thing. Now you know this happens in education, and you know it happens even in a movie or something like that, right? Or you know those, um, uh, what are those called? Those? Uh, what do they call those with the DVD? And there's uh, the after scenes or something, where the production or the production team's commenting on the film. You know what it's called? Behind the scenes kind of thing, right? So they'll show you the scene, and they'll pause and say, this is what was happening here, or here's some important notes. So th this happens in film nowadays. But it's really remarkable that in the Qur'an, this ancient document, this kind of pausing and then commentary and then going back, just seamlessly, just seamlessly happens, right? So this, now Allah's commentary is very interesting. He says, we, we gave the human being a very strong counsel in regards to both his parents. Allah is now talking about how you have to be really good to both your parents. It's interesting that Allah would interject that right now. Just now, Luqman was talking to his son, telling him you shouldn't do shirk. Shirk is a huge crime. Inna shirka la dhulmun azim. It is a great injustice for you to do shirk. Okay. Now Allah says, let me tell you, I have always told human beings to be good to their parents. It's interesting because just the last ayah was not about us being good to our parents. The ayah was actually about a parent being good to us. A parent is giving a son advice, isn't it? It's the other way around. But Allah is so, He's making us acknowledge that actually you're supposed to remember the favor of your parents. You should be grateful for them. Look at what a father does for a son. He gives him advice. But He didn't just limit the conversation to the, the father. He said, we gave the human beings advice that he should be good to or in regards to both of his parents. Now when you talk about both parents, you're talking about both father and Mother, if you read the rest of this ayah though, it's only talking about the mother. حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنًا وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَمَيْنٍ His mother carried him one load on top of another load. By the way, the he, his mother carried him, is actually not just about, human, uh, or about the male. The fetus in Arabic, or the baby, is actually, the, the word for it is masculine, which means it could refer to the masculine, or a boy or a girl. Which is why in the Quran, you know, you know about this, uh, maybe you've heard it in Sunday school or somewhere else, they used to bury the baby girl alive, right? وَهُوَ فِي الْخِصَامِ غَيْرُ مُبِينَ The Quran says, the small little baby who can't even make arguments yet. You know, أَمَّا الَّذِي يُنْشَأُ فِي حِلْيَةٍ The one who is raised playing with jewelry, وَهُوَ فِي الْخِصَامِ غَيْرُ مُبِينَ And can't even make a clear argument yet. Is, uh, uh, some, somebody raised in jewelry, is that a boy or a girl? That's a girl, but it says وَهُوَ فِي الْخِصَامِ غَيْرُ مُبِينَ Not هِيَ هِيَ is for she, هُوَ is for he. It uses the he because for a baby, هُوَ is used. For a small baby, that gender distinction isn't made. Okay, So that's why here it could refer to boy or girl. Now, his mother carried him one load after another, meaning one trimester after another trimester after another trimester. As every month went by, her belly started getting heavier and heavier. The back started hurting more and more and more. You and I were causing our mom a lot of pain physically. Physically, she was hurting more and more and more for months and months and months because of us. 
She couldn't sleep properly. She couldn't lie down on her back. It would absolutely crush her back. She had to lie down on her side. You try experiencing some of her experiences. Take a book bag, fill it with textbooks, put it on your stomach instead of your back, and don't take it off for nine months. See how that feels. See how, how much fun it is to, how often you have to go to the bathroom when your bladder is being constantly pressed with that much weight. See how much, how, how much you feel like eating, even when you're hungry, when your stomach's constantly being crushed. And everything you eat, the baby takes it, the baby eats it, and you're still hungry. And you eat more, and the baby eats it again, and you're still like, uh, stop it. <laughs> like, you know. And then the baby thank, thanks the mother some more, because the baby sometimes decides to stretch inside. <laughs> and like this weird alien paw thing comes out of the belly. It's scary stuff. And he'll like pull her ribs and stuff. And then he almost kills her, and she almost kills her when she's being delivered. The amount of blood, the amount of loss of like limb that the mother experiences at the time of birth. I've been in the delivery room six times. And I'm not the victim. She is. But I, I'm traumatized. I'm traumatized by what she has to go through. It's, it's insane. It's, just, it's really insane. I, I first time I was, when Husna was born, when I was there in the delivery room, I cried like a baby. She, Husna cried less, I cried more. And I called my mom and I cried and I, I'm sorry mom, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry for what I did to you. I'm sorry I'm such a lousy son. It just made me realize what my mom went through. She was giving me birth, you know. It's so unbearable for some women. For some women it's easy. Some auntie used to make a joke to my wife. Oh, you only have six? You should have like 12. It's crazy aunties, man. Some of these crazy aunties. She said it in Urdu. I don't even know how to say this in English. Like, <laughs> I sneeze and a baby pops out. Like, Please, auntie, don't ever say that again to anyone else. Now I've said it on film. It's great. Okay. But anyway. <laughs> but any it's not easy. Now Allah is mentioning all this stuff about the mom. He mentions nothing about who? Ah, but you know, he did. The last ayah was about the dad, wasn't it? And so Allah is saying that the great contribution of the mom began even before the baby was born, but the great contribution of the dad is going to be when he finds the right time to give advice and show the son love and then tell him not to do shirk and teach him his religion and make sure that he lives a good life. That's the father's role. That's the father's contribution. So the father's already been mentioned. What's, what hasn't been mentioned was the mother. So now the mother started getting mentioned. Your mother raised you or his mother you know, carried him a load on top of a load. And feeding him within a course of two years, meaning the breastfeeding of the child, which for some, some women is even more painful than delivery. The first time they have to feed the child, it's even more painful. you know. And then Allah says now, Be grateful to me and to be, be grateful to both your parents. Be grateful to me and both your parents. Now, this, the entire discussion began, Luqman was given wisdom to be grateful to Allah. And now that same discussion is carrying forward and Allah is saying, I have given all human beings the, the legacy, the advice that they should be grateful to me and be grateful to both one's parents. Allah could have mentioned so much more creation. So many other people that we're supposed to be grateful for, He specifically mentioned parents. There's a lot of reasons for that. A few I need to mention here. We were brought into this earth by Allah, but in the seen world, in the seen sense, we were brought into this earth by our parents. Allah provides all of our food, but in the physical sense, who did Allah make the means for providing us our food? Our parents. Allah protects us, but in the physical sense, who did Allah give that responsibility? Our parents. Allah clothes us, but physically our parents clothes us. Clothes us. Allah teaches us, He taught the human being what he didn't know. He taught the human being the names of Adam Ali the names of all things. He taught the human being how to speak. But technically, who, Allah teaches us how to speak. But who did Allah use to teach us how to speak? Our parents. In other words, much of what Allah did for us, He did through our parents. Now, in other words, we are uh, the parents are the the scene the seen gift of Allah. They're doing the work of Allah that He wants to do for us. 
So he didn't directly teach me how to speak. He taught me to speak through my parents. He didn't directly give me clothes. He gave me clothes through my parents. He didn't directly give me food. He gave me food through my parents. You understand this point? Which means, in a sense, my parents are actually ambassadors of Allah in raising me. They're Allah's ambassadors. They represent Him. They represent His work. That he, the gifts He's done to me, they've, so many of them have come through Him. So, when a child is small, the most important entity in their life is who? Their parents. And sometimes parents get worried about that. Parents say, how do I talk to my child about Allah? How do I talk, the lady comes to me, how do I talk to my two-year-old son about Allah? I'm like, lady, chill out. He's two years old. He's your only child, isn't it? Yes, it's my first child. What am, how am I going to teach him about Allah? He's two years old. Relax. It's okay. They will learn about Allah in time. Right now, who do they need to know about? You. You, talk, you mention Allah, you do dhikr of Allah, you pray. They don't understand, but they'll still pray with you. They'll over time, they'll learn. But actually, the most important entity in the beginning of their life is the parents. Their refuge is the parents. The source of love is the parents. Protection is the parents. Provision is the parents. Everything you think of later on with Allah, in the beginning of your life, as a child, who do you think of? Your parents. Your parents. You know, later on in life, when you get scared, you say, A'udhu Billah. Astaghfirullah. Subhanallah. When a baby gets scared, when a two-year-old gets scared, when a six-month-old gets scared, what do they say? Mama! Mama! They do that or no? You know? They, because everything that Allah is to us in the grand scheme of things, when you're a child, when you're a child, all you see, you don't see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't even understand Allah yet. But all you understand is what? Mama. Parents. SubhanAllah, this is a very powerful reality. This is why Allah Azza wa Jal put, be grateful to me, and who? Both your parents. And if you don't learn to be grateful to your parents, you'll never learn to be grateful to Allah. They're hand in hand. If your relationship is no good with your parents, then I can guarantee you, your relationship is no good with Allah. If you're not, do and some parents are bad parents. I'll just come out and say it. Your parents aren't. But some parents are, they're abusive, they're physically abusive, they're emotionally abusive, they don't take care of any responsibilities that they have, and all of it. Those are exceptions. But the vast majority of us, the vast majority of us, we have to be good to our parents. And that is us, part of the, part, us being grateful to our parents is actually indirectly us being grateful to Allah. Us being grateful to Allah. You know, Allah provides us in the unseen. Allah protects us in the unseen. I, you know, I physically I get my check in the mail or I get like a deposit in the bank or whatever. This is how I get paid. But we, we know as a part of our faith, who's actually paying you? Allah is. But that's in the unseen, isn't it? You can't trace the bank transfer back to Allah. That's in the unseen. But with parents, what they did for you, is that in the unseen? Or is that actually something that physically happened? Did she physically carry you in her stomach? Did she physically de deliver you? Did she physically feed you? Did your father physically raise you? He, he did. That's not, in the, that's not some matter of faith that I have to believe it, even though I've never seen it. You've experienced it yourself. If you can't even be grateful for what you experienced in the seen world, how can you be expected to be grateful to Allah who does everything from the unseen? That doesn't make any sense. Which is why Allah mentioned the parents first. Now I told you in the beginning, Luqman's, Luqman was given wisdom to be grateful. And the first bit of wisdom that he shared with his son was, don't do what? Don't do shirk. In other words, the opposite of being grateful is being a person of shirk. And we talked about slavery and the five, kind, five elements of slavery. And you can do shirk in any one of those five. You, you recall, recall all of those things. Okay. But now you'll notice that the gratitude thing has just been mentioned. Be grateful to Allah and parents. The second subject that Allah taught us was about shirk. So you'll notice the next ayah goes over to shirk. So it's the same two subjects that were there, now repeating themselves. So this, the two subjects of ayahs number 12 and 13 are now coming up beautifully again in ayahs number 14 and 15. So notice ayah number 15. in jahadaka ala an tushrika bi ma laysa laka bihi ilm. And if they both, meaning both of your parents, are struggling against you, they're fighting against you, that you should do shirk with me, yani with Allah, meaning with Allah, in, whatever, in a way that you have no knowledge of. In other words, they're asking you to do something that is not based on any knowledge. And they have no, you know, uh, and there is no basis for it. And they're still asking you to do it. They're asking you to 
follow their pagan practices or practice something that you know is not from Islam and it's clearly an act of shirk and you can't do it. They're asking you for shirk in love or shirk in obedience or shirk in wor worship or shirk in trust, you know, and shirk in your relationship with Allah, in any of those things. Then, فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا Then don't obey them. Don't obey them. Allah does not say, okay, fine, now you don't have to be grateful to them. No, you're still grateful to them, but you're just not going to obey them. You're, not just, you're simply not going to obey them. You know, the example of that in the Qur'an is Ibrahim alayhi salam, whose father committed a lot of shirk. And Ibrahim alayhi salam loves his dad, and he's supposed to be grateful to his dad too. But even though he's grateful to his dad, he's still not going to obey him. But obey him in what? He, he can only disobey him when it means disobedience to Allah. In everything else, he still has to obey his dad. In everything else, the relationship is still intact. We have this attitude, please listen guys, we have this attitude of all or nothing. All or nothing. My parents are asking me to do something clearly haram, I'll disobey them. Then my parents are asking me to do the dishes and clean the room or mow the backyard or whatever. Do I have to do that? Yes, because they told you and that's enough, obey them. The only time you get to disobey them is when obeying them would have meant shirk. Is that clear to everybody? So pretty much in every other circumstance we have to obey our parents. We have to listen to our parents. On the other side, I want to say something to parents. And this is for something, for, I can say this to parents, you guys can't say this to your parents. I will repeat myself. I can say this to the parents. You, friends, cannot say this to your parents. Sometimes parents take their right that Allah has given them, that they should be obeyed, and they abuse that right and they put their children in difficult positions, asking them to do things that they don't want to do, and making their lives miserable, just because they can quote the ayah, you have to obey me. This is dhulm, and you will be asked by Allah about it. People that are put under your command are your responsibility, and you have to give them love. Luqman's advice to his son was not, Amuruka ya ibni al-himar, ushkur lillah, wa la tushrik bihi. I'm, I'm giving you advice, my son who's a mule, you better not do shirk and you better be grateful to Allah. That is not how Allah taught us his example. Allah taught us his example and, he, and he, taught, he talked to his child with love, with counsel. And he talked to him about his rights to Allah first. A lot of times parents, you guys become very selfish. And all you want for your children is to obey you, even if it means disobeying Allah. You need to stop this. And even, even the parents who want their children to disobey Allah still quote the ayah of the Qur'an. You know, the Qur'an says, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا This is abuse in the name of the Qur'an. Allah does not take that lightly. Allah has given you an honorable position, but you, Bani Israel was given an honorable position too. They abused it. Don't abuse the honor Allah has given you. Do not abuse it. You know, this becomes complicated when our children are of the age of marriage. And I know when to speak. My kids are still preteens. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> you know, you know, I'm on the verge of one teenager. Oh my God. <sighs> yeah, seriously. Those of you that are parents of teenagers, and I, and I know I feel your pain to some extent, and I know one of the desperate reasons you came to this program and dragged your children here, even though they didn't want to come, they're off in the summer. They would rather be home. They would rather be on their PS4, not three but they're here, they're miserable, but you're still dragging them, and every drive back home, you say to them, did you listen to what he said? Did you listen? What did you learn? What did Mom, come on, I got it. God, I hate going anywhere. Uh, uh, yes, I have a webcam installed in your car, and I know what's going on. <laughs> you know, but I know why you dragged them here, because you're scared of these teenage, these these things that are turning into something else. You're not almost not recognizing what this creature is that lives in your house. It used to be such a cute kid and now his voice is starting to tear open like this and he's, you know. <laughs> Some facial hair is there but not quite and emotionally he's becoming a lot more aggressive and he talks back and he starts questioning things and you don't know how to handle it and that's why you're here and it's okay. Inshallah this might help but at the end of the day you guys who are considered adults in Islam, and you two who are considered adults in Islam, I didn't call this Qur'an for young children, I called it Qur'an for young adults for a reason. Because in, in Islam, when you, are, when you hit the preteen years, when you, actually when you hit teenage years, then you are considered 
an adult by Allah, not by you and me, not by state law, not according to driving regulations, not according to liquor licenses, but accord, or a gun license or whatever, but according to Allah, you guys are actually adults, which means if you were to go before Allah right now, you will not be tried as a child. You'll be tried as an adult. So you have to make your own decisions. And parents need to understand, we need to empower our kids at this age so they can make the right decisions for themselves because that's what Allah expects from them. You can only pamper them so much. We can only cuddle them so much. There's a time that comes where they have to be on their own. They will have to make their own decisions. They're going to go to the mall with their friends and they're going to choose to pass by the Victoria's Secret store without looking. They're going to make that choice themselves. And if they don't make that choice, that's, that's on them, not on their parents. There, there's going to be some, some spam email that comes to them which links to filth and they're not going to open it and erase it even though they know what it is. Even though shaitan tempted them, they still gonna, they're going to spam it and not look at it. And that's going to be a choice they make. It's going to have to be a choice. There's going to be some, somebody who pokes them on Facebook and they're going to recognize that's a poke from shaitan. And they're not going to respond. And girls are going to go through this, boys are going to go through this. And your parents aren't always going to be there. So, and if, if on the other side, if parents are struggling against you to make you do something that's not right, فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا wa sahibhuma fi dunya ma'rufa. This is the most important bit of advice here for you guys because it's hard. Don't obey them while staying in their company in a decent way. Accompany both of them. Spend time, literally the Quran is saying, spend a lot of time with your mom and dad in a good way. In other words, when you spend a lot of time with them, don't get on their nerves and don't allow them to get on your nerves. Don't let tempers and, and temperatures and volumes rise. Th keep things chill, keep things happy. If mom is starting to yell at you, start mas massaging her feet. If she kicks you in the face, say, mom, you've been taking karate classes, that was really good. <laughs> you know, turn it into a joke, but stay with them. And eventually your mom's temperature is going to chill out. Dad is about to yell at you, give him a hug, go vacuum the room. Sorry dad, I know I'm a loser, but you know, um, you know, just, just right here, just right here. I was like, <laughs> you know, and he'll calm down too. But you guys need to learn to diffuse the situation and not be the emotional messes that you guys become. Your mom says one thing and you flip out. You're like this piece of dynamite, it's just ready to explode. So your mom says, what were you doing? You're always asking me questions! Why are you always asking me? <laughs> what just happened? What just happened? Where did that explosion come from? You know? You're so tough with your friends. Your friends look at you like, Hey, you're so ugly. You're such a loser. You're such a, and you're like, you're fine. And your mom says, how's your day? Stop interrogating me! I can't take it anymore. I'm like, why does your tolerance level go down so much? when your father or your mother talk to you, but when your friends talk to you, it's all good. They could rip you to shreds and you're still fine. Like, ha, that's pretty funny. I'll get you next time, you know? You, have, you know, same thing with you guys. Stop, stop losing it, especially when your dad talks to you. Mom, you can handle, because mom, you know, mom's easy on you. But a lot of times, your dad? That's not an easy conversation because you feel like nothing you ever do is good enough. He's always complaining. He's always telling you you're not praying enough. You're not doing enough. You're not reading Quran. You didn't do your homework. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. What about this hairdo? What about this? What about that? What about your shirt? Why are you always wearing a t-shirt? Why can't you ever iron your clothes? Why can't you do this? But you're like, oh, dad, stop it. Stop it. You know, you sound like you're possessed by the, the, thing, the thing from the ring. You know, the Lord of the Rings. Like, ah, it burns us. Like, <laughs> you know, so. But you know what? The ayah says, even if they're telling you to do shirk, don't listen to them, but stay in their company. Stay in their company. Ma'rufa in a decent way. In the way that you're supposed to. Stay respectful, stay friendly, stay in service to your parents. Even if they themselves are doing shirk and they keep telling you to do shirk, don't do it and still stay in service. Don't storm out of the house. Don't say, I don't, want, I don't take this anymore. I'm going to my room. No, you're staying with them. You're staying on the couch. And you're not just sitting there like pugged like this. And your mother said, why are you looking at me like that? What? I can't look? I, I, I can't use my eyes? Well, I didn't say anything. I love that. I didn't say anything. Your face says a lot. The Quran actually talks about arrogance being manifest in the way people look. Not the mouth. ثُمَّ نَظَر ثُمَّ عَبَسَ وَبَصَر He stared. He frowned. 
Like there are a lot of answers, talkbacks in your head, and you didn't say them. And for you somehow, this is a great accomplishment. The mom says, you don't ever listen. <laughs> What'd you say? I was reciting Quran. <laughs> like, uh, you know. <laughs> Excuse me? What'd you say? Nothing, I didn't say anything. <laughs> you know, you need to cut that out. You need to stop being so angry. You need to chill out with your parents. They have a right to be mad at you. And chances are, you are dumb. You are wrong. You are being arrogant. You are being outrageous. Yes, there are times where your parents are wrong. But I can tell you, with a great degree of confidence, there are 99% chance you're the one who's out of line. And you're just too into it to see it. You're too in the zone to see that you're actually the one who's wrong. You're the one who's acting up. You're the one with the attitude problem. You're the one who's acting entitled. Not them. And they get frustrated over time and then they flip out and then you're like, why are they flipping out like this? Why are they going crazy? Why is my mom like so psycho sometimes? I don't even understand. <laughs> you know? Girls are talking among each other. My mom, she just goes crazy. And she, my mom gets mad. It's like, oh my God. It's so bad. You know? And they're, they're venting to their friends. But you know what? What do you do? You're so innocent. I don't even do anything. I don't even know why she gets mad. I love that line. I don't even know why you get mad. I just have to I've done anything. <laughs> and that's actually exactly true. Because they ask you to clean your room, or vacuum the house, or finish your homework, or finish your dinner, or, you know, just, can you, can you at least do this for your brother or your sister? Or could you turn that off? Or could, But you literally did nothing. Why are they mad? I didn't do anything. Yes, that's because you didn't do anything. <laughs> you should have done something. <laughs> I love this ayah because it's so hard to live by. The Quran is very practical. Spend time with your parents. Musahaba is used in Arabic when you accompany someone for a long time. When you accompany someone for a long time. Especially for young people, this is tough. And parents, have mercy on your children. Give them reason to spend a long time with you. If you are constantly yelling and criticizing your children, please, they are also human beings. You cannot humanly expect that someone would like to be around you if you're constantly criticizing them. If that is not true of any other human being, please, that is also true of your children. So you can't keep saying, you get back here, I'm not done. You get back here, I'm not done. You keep doing that. Well, you know what? A time will come where this kid will flip and he will not come back. Then you'll come to me. My son doesn't come back. I don't know what happened. I was such a loving mother. I took care of him all the time. I was like, auntie, auntie, I know what you did. You can level with me. No, no, sometimes I got a little angry. That wasn't a little angry. You, you make the Hulk look like a librarian. You, you, <laughs> you have a problem. You need, to, you need to calm your temper. As your children get older, the more love and the more counsel is needed. This is the advice of Luqman, that's wisdom. You know, my, uh, I've talked about this in parenting, about anger management for parents, especially with kids that are teens, because teens will test our patience. You know who, which, teen, which father was tested with teenage boys? Which father? In the Quran? Yaqub alayhi salam. And what kind of mess up did they do? Did they like ruin the car or you know, drop some paint on the carpet or break, them, break some dishes or... What did they do? They killed one of their brothers. You walk into the house and tell your father, you know that whole wolf thing? It actually happened. <laughs> you think that's going to go over easy? You would expect him to explode. Oh, wolf thing happened, huh? Come here. But what, is, what does he do? What does Yaqub Aysam do? فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَانُ عَلَى مَا تَصِفُونَ The only thing beautiful left now is patience. I just got to be patient. I can't do anything. You know why he couldn't do anything? Because they were teens. You can only be patient with them. You lose it with them, you lose them. You lose them. Look, I'm talking to both sides. This is not for you guys to use as a weapon against your parents because that means that you're, you're scum if you do that. The Qur'an is not for you to take advantage of other people or impose on them what you deserve. The Qur'an is for you to take your own responsibility. I told you, you're going to be tried as adults, just like your parents will be. 
I'm not talking to you as kids. You guys are adults. You guys are adults. Take responsibility with your parents. Your parents will be more merciful to you after they hear this, inshallah, and you have to be a lot more patient with your parents than you have been. A lot more. If nothing else comes out of this Ramadan, at least that does, inshallah. That's a project for you. What, what can I do for my mom and dad that I didn't do before? What more can I do? What more do that, that, what is it that keeps disappointing them? What keeps making them upset? And I keep doing it over and over and over again. And they keep telling me, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this. And I keep doing it. What about that can I change? What can I demonstrate that I've changed for them? So they can be a little happier with me. Because I tell you one thing, man. If there's one thing you will earn that will make your life good is your parents' dua. When they're proud of you or when they're happy with you and they make dua for you, that dua goes direct connection. And Allah just opens the floodgates of good for you. Just make your parents happy. Just make them happy. And that goes for the elders here too. If your parents are alive and you're lucky enough, make them happy. Spend time with them. It's not just about teens. You know? There are so many... Uh, it's a tangent. I, I won't go there. It hurts too much. Anyway. So, وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا وَاتَّبِعْ سَبِيلَ مَنْ أَنَابَ إِلَيَّ This is again another critical part in your young life. And while you're not going to follow your parents, if they're telling you to do shirk, and you're still spending time with them, you still need a source of inspiration. You still need someone who's going to be a source of positive influence for you. Who are you going to get good things from if your parents are calling you to shirk? وَاتَّبِعْ سَبِيلَ مَنْ أَنَابَ إِلَيَّ Follow the path of whoever turned back to me. Find people who have turned back to Allah. Find people who are trying to learn Allah's deen. Find people who are trying to live a better life as a Muslim. And surround yourself with them. Be in their company. Follow them. Follow good people in life. In the ayah Allah has given, through father giving, talking to the son, he's telling his son, listen son, find good friends. Find good friends. Find people that when you're around them, you become a better person. They, when you're around them, it wants you to become more honest, more truthful, more sincere. You want to become closer to Allah. You want to become a better, you know, a more patient person, a more wise person, a more serious person. F spend time with those people. Most of the time you guys make friends and those friends, you're already not that smart, but when you're with your friends, you get really dumb. And then you're around some people, when you're around them, you get more intelligent. They make you more mature. Find those kinds of friends. The people who've turned back to Allah themselves. وَاتَّبِعْ سَبِيلَ مَنْ أَنَابَ إِلَيَّ then Allah says, ثُمَّ إِلَيَّ مَرْجِعُكُمْ Look, at the end of the... Eventually, you're going to come back to me anyway. فأ, anyway, فَأُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ Then I then will inform you of the things that you used to do. One last ayah, inshallah ta'ala. No, we don't have time for one last ayah. It's already 2 o'clock. Okay, so we'll continue inshallah. It's okay, we're taking our time with this passage. It's that important. It's just that important. So we've, what we've com concluded thus far is the interjection from Allah. The two comments Allah made about life, about your lives, on his own and then we're going to go back to what Luqman said to his son. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.